to our first session post research by Dr. Delhi sir. As he has completed his BDS and MDS in public health dentistry from Bapuji Dental College and Hospital in the year 2016. Presently working as assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Dentistry, chief curator and co-founder of PhD 101 national level online learning portal for dental public health, former CEO of BF BCL, an advertising agency and event management company, professional MC external resource speaker on diverse topics from various acclaimed schools, won numerous awards in debating, collage, photography, literature, and various other extracurricular activities. Denzi sir, I would like, I would request you to take from me. Thank you so much for that uh, short and crisp introduction. Okay, is my audio and video all clear there? Yes, sir. Perfect, great. Okay, so where are we now post lunch? I think uh, let's have some food for thought, right? Just so that all that which you grab in, you know, uh, digest completely and peacefully in that direction. Okay, all right. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Denzi Lawrence and I would be talking to you about the presentation, which is uh, very curiously titled Being Human. All right, just share my screen. Okay, is that coming around fine? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Okay, first of all, thank you so much everyone at the P-Value and IDS and Biostudent, everyone who's uh, put this thing together and actually bringing about uh, some orientation regarding research and statistics for our budding researchers uh, who are going through this process here. Now, uh, we are right in the middle of the program, which is what started yesterday. I'm sure you all would have enjoyed a lot of deliberations from the beginning, uh, be it introduction to research, the designs, and so much so forth, right? So today we're going to have uh, a candid discussion on biomedical ethics in the context of how it is to be human. All right. So quickly, uh, can I have people uh, use the chat box and give me quick responses? Uh, let me know if you're there. Yes, no. Quickly, quickly, everyone, raise your hand, raise your feet, whatever possible. Yes, all right. Apart from the volunteers. Okay, excellent. Yes, awesome. All right. This is called the social desirability bias in case, you know, one of them says yes and everybody says yes together. You know, when we ask to point out in a class that who would be answering this, uh, it usually happens that, you know, you don't want to be the first one to raise your hand, but then you, you really quickly follow the trend and then go to the rest of it. All right, great. So guys, let me know if there's any technical glitches, you know, in the chat box. And we're going to keep this a little casual. All right. Now uh, I can see a lot of participants here quickly from various uh, colleges here, undergraduates, interns, and, and all of them who are keenly listening to all these sessions here. <clears throat> so yes, there you are. I think uh, we're good to go. All right. So can I start if I could ask the moderator? Yes, sir. Okay, great. All right. Menno, who am I talking to? Uh, we have volunteers as well as, right? Okay. Hmm. Okay. So first and foremost, uh, let's just uh, get the terminologies really clear, right? Now this word ethics is derived from the Greek word, right? Ethos. Now ethos means uh, your custom or character. Now, when we define it in terms of medical terminologies, uh, the word ethics actually means the science of what is morally right. Now this might actually intrigue you when it comes to how can we assess what is morally right in a very conscientious manner. That is, how can we apply science to deciding what is right and what is wrong? Now, when I ask everybody on a moral high ground, okay, I just want to uh, give everybody a situation before we start this off, all right? So if you're just following me, just let me know, uh, and I want your responses in the chat box, all right? Now, let's say that we are at a railway crossing, all right? Now, we are at a railway crossing, and there is a train which is expected to come across, and then you are able to, you know, uh, visually see the train approaching towards the crossing and you are in quite close proximity. Now you notice that at the other end of the track, there are a couple of people who are stuck on the railway tracks, right? 
Now, when people are stuck there on the railway tracks for some reasons whatsoever, you can see that an accident is going to happen, all right? Now, my question to all of you here who are attending this session here, right, is if you're able to do something to stop the train, would you do so or not, okay? How many of you would do something given the situation, whatever possible, let me just stop the train. Maybe put an obstacle, put you know uh, something in between so that I can save the lives of so many people who are about to be killed, all right? How many of you would do that? Yes? Quick, quick. It's a very simple question, guys. How many of you would do? Okay. Uh, someone says, I'll do something to stop the train. Something, let's come to what that something is. But I'm sure everybody would agree on this point that you would do something, right? Even if it is in your own capacity and you're able to visually see this, all right? Now, this is what is ethically the point of question here, all right? Everybody wants to be morally right, all right? Now, it's it's very simple, right? It's, it's either black or white. Now, you want to do something or you do not want to do something, right? So ideally, when you're a doctor, you're in working in the interest of your patient, you would do anything in order to prevent any unintentional harm or injury or any of these things. But ethics is merely just beyond that, all right? Now, let me just slightly modify the situation for you. What if you find a couple of hefty boys standing, you know, a little before the people who are hung on the tracks, and then you had an opportunity that you had nothing around you, but if you could push these people onto the tracks. Now that is technically murder, right? Now you are actually killing someone to protect someone else. So how many of you would do that? How many of you would kill to save somebody else? How many of you would do that? Yes, please use, use the chat box guys and, and let me know. How many of you would morally justify doing something good for the greater good of the population, right? So we have a response which says, yes, they wouldn't. Okay, I really appreciate guys, if you could uh, give me more responses, let's make this really interesting, all right? Trust me, I've got a lot of interesting content for y'all and uh, uh, all of it is even remotely not, you know, uh, gonna be boring like, like a regular theory class, okay? So we've tried to have references for movies and feature films and all of that, okay? So how many of you participants think that is all right to do something which is not normally correct or morally right for the greater good of your patients, okay? Now I have rephrased the question. How many of you would do that? How many of you would prescribe a drug which is probably not tested completely, but has some probability of saving the lives of many, all right? So this is your proposition, okay? Now, given this background and this idea of understanding, the word ethics, right, essentially is the science of what is morally right, right? So once you find out the basic difference, let's try to break this down and understand. Now, the science of the ideal human character and the behavior, okay, in situations where the distinction must be made between the right and the wrong. Now, the duty must be duly followed and good interpersonal relations should be maintained. So it is how we apply ethics to our medical sciences or dental sciences when we're talking about so many situations where there is bound to be some amount of conflict of interest, okay. I'm sure everybody has heard of this and would be taking this oath very soon. The Hippocratic Oath actually enshrines a very core component of ethics, which has to be practiced by the entire dental population, right? Dental, dental fraternity. All right. Now let's talk movies. Okay. Now you must be wondering why am I thinking, you know, of, of talking about a couple of movies here, but I think this is a very interesting way to introduce you all to the fascinating world of biomedical ethics which has got a lot of interesting history and development, which can be appreciated to a couple of blockbuster movies, which have been, you know, seen and heard over the many years. Okay. Now, how many of you have seen or watched this movie? This is called Schindler's List. And, and very recently we've had the 25th anniversary of, of this movie. And it's by a very, very famous uh, Hollywood movie director. Anybody? Anybody who's, who's thing? Okay. Preeti says yes. All right. Okay. Most of them would have seen this. Okay. Now the very interesting part about this movie is there is uh, the movie, which is entirely made in black and white. Okay. It is directed by none other than uh, the very famous Hollywood director who gave us Jaws and who gave us a lot of other many blockbuster movies like E.T. and all of that. Right. So it is Steven Spielberg. 
Now, Steven Spielberg directed this movie uh, about 25, 30 years ago. It's called Schindler's List, okay? Now, there was a German official, okay, an army official by name Oskar Schindler, okay, who used to work for the Nazis, okay? Now, this is, I'm taking you back to the Second World War. And in the time of the Second World War, there was this general who was very tough on the exterior, but eventually he understood that there is a lot of discrimination and all the, the, you know, the way they've treated the Jews, that is the whole episode of Holocaust, is something which is something unforgettable in the past history of the evolution. That's in the time of the Second World War. Now, as all of us know, you know, uh, Hitler had ordered the setting up of concentration camps and so much was being done because the Jews were seen as someone who could threaten the legacy, all right? So they believed uh, in, in a false narrative and they tried to exterminate and to conduct a lot of, you know, uh, experiments on this, okay? But the reason why I'm telling you about this movie is because after the Second World War, you know, eventually when Germany lost the war, okay, in this movie, you should be seeing uh, the part where, uh, you know, Oscar Schindler is empathetic and actually protects a lot of Jews from execution. So you can actually find descendants of that community which was saved by Schindler way back in, you know, at the time of Second World War, even till this day in, in modern in Israel, who are, you know, growing up and who live as a community. And in fact, they call the Schindler's Jews. Okay, you can okay, always look it up. It's a fantastic movie and it's got a very deeply disturbing audio track also, which is very, very used, you know, popular culture and cult following. Now, the reason why I brought this up was, if you talk in terms of the kind of, you know, ethical violations, okay, I'm using the word ethical violations because what was morally not supposed to be done was actually done at the time of Second World War when the Nazi doctors conducted various inhuman experiments, okay, just in terms of for the greater good of mankind or for testing drugs or for doing many other research projects, a lot of these Jews who were, you know, prisoners in the concentration camps, for no mistake of theirs, were being employed into these inhuman experimentations. And because of this, post the Second World War, these Nazi doctors were actually tried in a court of law, and that led to the rise of the Nuremberg Code. Okay? These famous trials, which I'll be mentioning later, are the Nuremberg trials. All right? Now, quickly, I have another movie which I'd like to discuss. Okay? Before that, I'd like to show uh, everybody here that you know we are having a small uh, video, which is actually a public, you know, apology by none other than the former president of the United States, that is Bill Clinton. All right, let's hear what he's got to say. So today, America does remember the hundreds of men used in research without their knowledge and consent. We remember them and their family members, men who were poor and African American, without resources and with few alternatives. They believed they had found hope when they were offered free medical care by the United States Public Health Service. They were betrayed. damage done by the Tuskegee study is much deeper than the wounds any of us may have suffered. It, it speaks to our faith in government and the ability of medical science to serve as a face, as a force for good. We were treated unfairly, to some extent, like guinea pigs. We were not pigs. We were all hard-working men and not boys, and citizens of the United States. The wounds, the wounds rather, that were inflicted upon us cannot be undone. I'm saddened today to think of those who did not survive and whose families will forever live with the 
knowledge that their deaths and suffering was preventable. No power on earth can give you back the lives lost, the pain suffered, the years of internal torment and anguish. What was done cannot be undone, but we can end the silence. We can stop turning our heads away. We can look at you in the eye and finally say on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful, and I am sorry. Occurred within many of our own lifetimes to truly combat vaccine hesitancy and encourage diverse enrollment in clinical trials, we must first acknowledge this real history of mistreatment and exploitation of minorities by the medical community and the government. Then we need to explain and demonstrate all that has been done to address these wrongs. So today, America. Yes, guys. So I think uh, that was a brief and an overview about how Bill Clinton himself, no less than the president of the United States of America back then, came out and issued a public apology. Now this experiment, which is the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, okay, just to give you a little bit of perspective on that, was actually, you know, uh, something which had on undertaken by the United States Public Health Service for a very long period of time, where the participants of the study, okay, violating every ethical rule in the book, were actually injected with the syphilis virus, okay. Now I'm sorry, the syphilis uh, causing organism, which is Trypanoma palatium. So they eventually studied the natural course of the disease and they were promised you know a couple of hot and cooked meals and also provide burial insurance and medical benefits now today as we know it this is something which grossly violates human rights all right and this is why ethics or ethics in biomedical research or generally research ethics has gained so much of importance over the years because what is right is right okay so you need to take a moral high ground and then examine this and then you know go into detail and understand what exactly you'll be undertaking now, all of you here today, you've gathered in and you've you know, come across to learn the basic fundamentals of research methodology and statistics to actually pioneer your own research, you know, to bring about novel ideas to shape. But also do remember that in the end, there is the patient, hence there is the doctor. Okay? It's not because of the doctor that there is a patient. So we must understand this fundamentally and make sure that we don't violate the basic principles of ethical guidelines laid down by various organizations, which have been accumulated over years and years of travesty and justice being delivered, or rather not being delivered to what we have actually reached today. In fact, this famous uh, uh, syphilis experiment, right, was also captured in a American television war drama called Miss Evers Boys. Now, this is based on the true story of the decades-long Tuskegee experiment, and it was adapted from a stage play written by David Felsher. Now, this award, you know, winning film actually got a lot of category awards, including the outstanding made-for-television movie. And this is why, you know, I want to bring to a very, very important focus here that why do we need from learn from the mistakes of the past? Is only because we become better and become more evolved and more evolved as a species to conduct research with ethical high grounds. Now, there's also a movie called A Place for Annie, which is again how a lady takes care of an HIV positive patient, issues of confidentiality, of not revealing, all of these things, right? So there are many plenty movies like this. You can go up and look it up on the websites, you know, which are related to bioethics and biomedical research, which is plenty for us to give us a deep and a profound perspective into what medical ethics is all about. All right. So going back to your code of dental ethics, right? Now, why do we need a code for dental ethics? Now, members of any association, everybody working together, we need to understand what is our duty and what is our obligation. Now, it's also important that we uphold dignity and honor of our profession, right? So we need to lay down a code of dental ethics, which has been modified. And in the end, we're all promoting this in terms of advancement of dental sciences. So just to give you a run through, and this is, you know, something which you've studied in your theory and, you know, under public dentistry, that what are the various ethical principles, okay? First is to do no harm. Second is to do good. Third is respect. Fourth is justice. You know, then we have veracity or truthfulness, then confidentiality and fidelity. 
right? Now let's take this one by one. To do no harm is non-maleficence, okay? When was the last time you came across this? You know, when everyone, they tell you that if you're not able to do anything good, please don't do any harm to the patient, right? So don't be over enthusiastic and, you know, pro, you know come up with procedures which you have not mastered with reasonable care and then put the life of the patient into jeopardy, right? So even when you conduct research, also you need to follow the same principles. And definitely whatever we do, whatever research we come up with, whatever novel idea, be it a drug efficacy, be it an, another novel intervention, anything for that matter, it is always to do good for the patient, which is to create beneficence. Now, respect for persons, justice, veracity, all these are self-explanatory and you need to have an overview of all these ethical principles before we get into any other kind of medical research. Consent is a very important part here. You know, most of you here would be starting off with your own research protocols and, you know, would be writing for it and would be preparing and would actually be, you know, interested and very pumped up to conduct your own research and publish it and eventually flourish. But remember, there are certain types of consent which has to be practiced here, all right? What we practice in research is most commonly the third one, which is informed consent. Apart from that, there are, you know, types like implied, express, and proxy consent, which are beyond, you know, the scope of what we're about to be learning. But informed consent, remember, guys, all of you, that please make sure this is taken into account. That means whatever procedure, whatever intervention you are planning to do, Enlist the, what is the procedure, what is the evidence of benefit, what is the evidence of harm, weigh the benefits, risk, and all of these, inform the patient, take them into confidence, and then proceed with whatever intervention you are planning to do so. All right. Now, there are certain ethical rules for dentists, you know, prescribed by the DCI and has been revised over and again. Okay. This is not just the macro ethics we're looking at. Okay. We're also looking at the micro and the meso ethics where there's an overlay. So duties and obligations of the dentist towards the patients, okay? That what we need to conduct towards the patients, follow all the rules. Even duties of dentists towards each another. That's one another also, there is some ethical guidelines. And eventually duties of the dental professionals to the entire public. Now rules for the dentist towards patients, you be courteous, sympathetic, friendly, punctuality, all of these things, right? We know that you need to develop a likability towards your patients, right? Now, the patients should also reciprocate in the same way. So these are the kind of ethical rules which normally we see on a day-to-day -day basis, which are endless for dentists. Now, towards the patients, welfare is the most important thing, all right? You should follow your ethical code of conduct and then make sure that the welfare of the patient is given more importance than anything else. Most of all, you also should cherish pride in his or, you know, colleagues and should not disparage them by either by act of word or any other kind of malign commitments. Now, ethical rules towards one another, of course, we help each other in terms of emergencies to treat and also should make sure that you make way for the favor of your regular dentist. Now, apart from these things, again, you know, towards one another, we commonly come across this problems where one is, you know, going and bad mouthing about the other or a faulty restoration, all of these things. And this is very commonly going to happen in day to day practice. All right. So make sure that's the duty of a present dentist to make sure the correct treatment is done at once. All right. So little comments, possibly avoid the reflection on what has been done previously and without making, you know, making a big, you know, mountain out of a mole, make sure that you're avoiding all these things and making way for the best interest of the patient. Now, towards the public, we need to have a leadership role and in the community on matters related to dental health and so forth. So this is a quick recap about what other ethical codes are generally present for us. And this has to be followed, especially for research ethics. Okay, before I get into my research ethics, this was like a prologue for you to understand the context of ethics. Okay? Because you've been learning and reading and you know listening to a lot of speakers talk about you know how should you design a study, what should be the contents, and how should you go for publication, literature. All of these are all the you know important aspects of conducting research. But research ethics sort of adds as the flux which puts everything together. Right. So historically, like I mentioned, the World War II example, the Nazi human in experimentation led to the development of the Nuremberg Code. Then in the year 48, we had a declination of Geneva, which is the Human Rights Declaration. Then the World Medical Association came up with an international code, the Helsinki Declaration in 64, and finally the ICMR, which gives out the ethical guidelines for all the biomedical research on human participants, started in the year 1980 and has been revised continuously till 2020. Now, biomedical ethics, right? If you question certain fundamentals, you know, of 
what is the purpose of research right so you are essentially adding on information to whatever is there right whatever is there previously you would be adding on to information so that it is of certain value for anybody else in future now in biomedical ethics like i said you know all of these experiments from the past you know there have been many other experiments which is you know from the nazi experiments and then you know people been injected with live cancer cells and all of that which happened recently if you notice there have been many studies which have been retracted all right now this is an example that in the lancet you know new england journal it retracted your covid 19 studies indicating that one race safety concerns about malarial drugs all right this is also an alarming and exceptionally high rate of covid 19 retractions and here retraction from actual publication that it has been removed now when we notice this right why are most published research findings false okay and there is there is a summary here in fact in a study in the year 2005 it says the hotter a scientific field the less likely the research findings are to be true right what happens is you know when the whole world is talking about a certain thing it trends okay and once there is something which is trending there is a lot of you know good and quality information but it gets overshadowed by a lot of content which is not relevant or which is probably even falsifying in nature all right and that is the reason why we have to examine evidence with a lot of care and precision so remember you know just because something is published your research findings you know don't really depend on it on the face value because there is the likelihood that the research findings can also be not true now in india alone just to give you some perspective here right let's look at the retraction rate of academic publications now 127 papers from india were retracted for image duplication manipulation now these are the ethical guidelines when it comes to research okay now there's a lot of plagiarism there is a lot of copying here and there you know people don't cite properly so when you as a researcher if you're talking about you know ethical principles make sure that all of these things are taken care of all right and ever since you know since 2006 india has jumped double the retraction rate as compared to the united states and this is not something to be definitely proud of now there's something called predatory journals right and this is again to give you a world view on what was published recently that india contributes more than one third of the articles in predatory publications there is this mad rush to go for publications that we end up doing it on substandard or in predatory journals which are not even having an existing base all right so we need to understand that you know when we are fighting against this you know race for authorship and publication we need to understand that these predatory journals are destroying the basic nature of what scientific publications are meant to. now we did a couple of research findings and we understood that you know the evaluation of all the retracted publications in most of the cases would be because of plagiarism all right could be data manipulation could be redundant publication the reason why i'm telling you all these things are because you have all these reasons are the most common cited reasons because they have violated the research ethics okay because you're not supposed to copy from somewhere and not cite again you know maybe you do it intentionally or unintentionally all of these happens one third of the articles only because of data manipulations you know you're trying to play around with data and mix and match and then try to publish it again it eventually goes all right so most of the authors in such retracted publications were actually from india now to avoid all these things right i told you research ethic guidelines are also formulated again going from nuremberg helsinki and belmont report the icmr guidelines clearly enlist what is the proper way or the protocol to follow for biomedical research which should become the bible for all of your research uh, budding researchers to continue in this direction and to prepare your research proposals following these guidelines all right okay so let's quickly have a small activity here right just so that i get to know people are listening and not dozing off after a nice and a voluptuous lunch right all right yes so quickly can you please tell me which guideline first formulated after witnessing the nazi experiments okay is it 1 2 3 4 i keep the chat box open guys all right shoot is it the nuremberg code is it the helsinki declaration is the belmont report or the icmr guidelines okay i'm getting response one all right all right the nazi experiments which were you know basically decided in in this direction here right okay uh, is actually the nuremberg code sorry i think it's highlighted in in the wrong manner here it is in fact the nuremberg code of 1947 okay there seems to be a problem with the transitions so the boxes appear so all of you are correct all right 
let's quickly go back to the session here. How do you ensure ethical integrity in biomedical research? Okay. Now, we are talking about ethical compliance or ethical integrity whenever you're conducting a research. Okay. Now, you decide to check the effectiveness of a certain product or you want to check which one is better, any different kinds of intervention or like a pre and post. Okay. All of you would have your own ideas related to various fields of dentistry. All right. How do you make sure that you are ethically right at every point of time when you're conducting a research? All right. So there are various ways where you can evaluate yourself. All right. To begin with, right? To begin with, all of you have chosen, you know, to attend this webinar, to attend this session, all the wonderful sessions by the eminent speakers, is to develop knowledge and skills on the topics, right? So please make sure that a good understanding of all the methods and biostatistics, that is the competency levels, right? From experience to knowledge to skills to behavior to performance to even goals. Okay. You need to be the competent one. So developing all this knowledge and skills on research topics and getting good understanding is the way to begin with. Next is ethical approval, right? All of you should keep this thing in, in mind that all the research proposals and all of you belonging to various colleges would be aware of that, that there is an ethical review board, all right? So you need to get your research proposals approved from the ethics committee, all right? Or if you're even planning to conduct it on animal research, there is also an animal ethics committee, all right? So ethical integrity begins with getting the ethical approvals, all right? Now, there's another question which I'd like to pose. Let's see how much, how many of you would be, uh, you know, answering this in vitro research right which is research not involving humans and animals don't require ethical approval how many of you think this is true and how many of you think this is false yeah can i have your responses in the chat box how many of you think in vitro research that it's not involving humans and animals okay don't require ethical approval Okay, people think it's false. Okay. I'm going to get a series of false, 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 false. Okay, there's also someone who thinks it's true. Okay. All right. Okay. Not requiring ethical approval. See, let's understand this. Okay. Ethics is really not about that if you're doing it on a human, so you need to follow something or on animals, right? Any kind of research. Okay. You could potentially be at a position to harm the participants maybe in an indirect fashion okay just because you're doing something in a laboratory doesn't mean that you have all the morality to conduct any kind of research while reading all the guidelines all right even in vitro research all right you actually require the approval of the ethics committee all right so if you thought it was false yes it is correct okay consent like i said right this is something which all of you would require to prepare once you prepare your protocols, once you have your whole, you know, listed of how you would be doing and how you'd be addressing all these things, you are giving something called a informed consent and obtaining it from the patient. So make sure you package it with the relevant information. It is simple, crisp and comprehensive language, which the patient can read by themselves and understand. And also it should lead to the capacity to take decision for themselves, whether they choose to participate or not, and voluntariness should be reflected. Okay, so that is how you make sure that your informed consent is taken care of. Now that could be of two parts, right? When you prepare your informed consent form for your, uh, you know, proposal. In fact, you'll have to submit a copy of this when you present it in front of the ethics committee as well. One is the participant information sheet, another one is the informed consent form, right? So this is how you prepare the various parts. Now there are certain special conditions again. You need to make sure that if the patient is illiterate or unconscious or, or is a child, you need to take a legally authorized representative, which is consent from the legal person who's authorized, which is mandatory in this special circumstances. Now, informed consent can be waived off, right? But then research could not be carried out without waiver. Retrospective studies where you don't take it. If you take anonymized biological samples or any data which is available on public domain or in cases of emergencies and disasters. That is the only conditions where the informed consent is usually given a miss. All right. If the prospective research participants age is 16, all right, it's another question for you guys, then only take consent from the legally authorized representative and no assent. Only take assent from the participant and no consent is required or take consent from you know, the legally authorized representative and assent or take consent and assent from LAR, all right? So can I have your responses, guys? 
Okay. I hope you've understood the difference between consent and assent, right? So if the patient is a minor, all right, if your research participant is a minor and you need to collect information, you need to take the assent, which is the verbal assent from the person that is a participant and also take the consent from the, the legally authorized representative because the patient himself or herself is not in a position to give the approval for themselves, all right? So it's option number four, all right? So I guys, uh, I think, are you following everything so far? Quickly give me a, a yes or a no in the chat box. Is, is the speed okay or a, um, is it too much to take in, you know, on, on a Saturday afternoon? Okay. I can say Priya say yes. Anybody else quickly? Okay. All right. Now, there's another, you know, issue related to the payment for the participation. What happens is... Uh, people give incentives, right? Of course, it's all uh, under certain terms and conditions. So reimbursement for expenses incurred in connection with the participation, all right? There should not be any fee for research related activities. You know, what do we, what do we notice? You know, in fact, take the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. They were actually promised, uh, you know, so many dollars of money and their family given medical insurance and, uh, you know, uh, given food and, and various other incentives, right? No payment should be given to any legal, you know, authorized representative, right? And even if you fix a certain payment, that ethic, ethical committee has to, you know, do it, all right? I have a question. It's, it's option four, right? I think someone is asking you, all right? You can just put, put it here and you can do it. All right. Okay, can I continue, guys? I think someone had a doubt. It, it is four, all right? We need to take consent and assent from the legal authorized representative. Great. Now coming to the issue of privacy and confidentiality, okay? Whatever research you intend to do, right? Whatever information and data, please remember it is a repository of information which is extremely private and personal, all right? If it includes certain invasive conditions or terminal illnesses or rare diseases or something, you know, if you're conducting a research on conditions which are related, you know, which are commonly stigmatized in the society, there is an element of, you know, participants' privacy has to be maintained here, all right? And confidentiality of whatever you collect, you are responsible for that. So if in a court of law, you, you know, end up being uh, in a breach of confidence or if you end up telling out the information, and this is normally, you know, tends to happen in, in dental-related situations or medical concerns. So privacy and confidentiality is something which is, again, a core ethical principle, which completely applies to your research process as well. All right. The confidentiality applies to a person or a participant or only to the data of information. Quickly, I think this is a pretty simple one. Yes, guys. Is it option one or option two? Quick, quick, I need your responses. I need to know whether you guys are, are, are attentive or not. Right. All right. See, confidentiality per se, right? Okay. Uh, we are talking about what information you're collecting, right? Privacy is related to the person. Now, that is what I, I mean to, you know, uh, ask in this in this text. Uh, so probably someone who's off, you know, answered one who thinks confidentiality. It's not about keeping the person, uh, I you know, this thing. It's about whatever information you collect from them. All right. That has to be kept and maintained confidentially, all right? Now, the privacy of the person, again, if they choose to be, uh, you know, present or absent or anonymous and all these things, but here we're talking about confidentiality related to the information of the data rather than the person or the participant, all right? Who you talk to cannot be, see, it's not about confidentiality per se like that, all right? We're talking about privacy for person and participant and confidentiality for data or the information. I hope it's clear so far. Okay. Next, another important point, which I'd like to highlight here, okay, before uh, I think we have another five or 10 minutes, is the benefit and the risk assessment, all right? You're talking about the physical, psychological, economical, social, and legal, right? And the individual society and community. So our entire intention in this whole process is to maximize the benefits and to minimize the risks, all right? And that is how we need to make sure the entire benefit risk assessment is done. Compensation for any research related, you know, uh, 
kind of, of situations where, you know, a patient might be harmed and all these things, you must make sure that you have an inbuilt mechanism for compensation, that if something goes wrong, if medical expenses, you must have a mechanism or a protocol that who will be awarding the compensation and how much, all right? And all of these should be compulsorily reported to your ethical committee within 24 hours after the actual outcome has occurred. Okay. Finally, when it comes to research, what happens is there is something called a conflict of interest. Okay. All of you, when you pick up your articles towards the end, you'll notice that there is, you know, conflict of interest and probably would have been mentioned as none or nil. Okay. What usually happens is in any research article or when you come together as primary and secondary researchers, you will notice that there could be a conflict of interest either in the ideological perspective or the financial perspective or related to authorship, all of these things, right? So your primary interest, okay, such as your participant welfare or research validity, it might be, you know, influenced by secondary interest. If someone's personal interest of giving authorship or academic reasons and all of these things. So that is the reason why conflict of interest should always be disclosed, even if it is there towards the end of your research article. And finally, keep in the concept of distributive justice, okay, the burdens and benefits should be equitably distributed, all right, among all the sections of the you know, or society and make sure you're involving participants from everywhere. Okay. Debriefing is a very, very important thing. Okay. Whatever has happened after you conduct your research, make sure you go and you explain to the patients. All right. You explain to them and tell them that, see, these are the research findings and this is what we intend to do and so on and so forth. And finally, when it comes to publication, reporting and all of these things should be very transparent and truthful. Authorship, give substantial contribution, right? Give credit where it's due. If somebody's helped you design it, somebody's read the manuscript for you, somebody's drafted, someone has, you know, probably proofread, mention their acknowledgements. Because in the end, ethics is not just what you feel is correct, what is morally right and has to be done. And this is why I'm telling you, when usually we get carried away when we conduct research, when we do so many fantastic things, we sort of undermine the research component in terms of the ethical principles, right? So make sure this is also there too. Avoid research misconduct, right? Fabrication, falsification, plagiarism. Like I told you right in the beginning that, you know, Indians are rather famous or infamous for these things. So it's time we break the mold. We tell the world that we do value human subjects. We do value human values. And we shall and we would conduct all the dental research with a very, very high level of ethical integrity conforming to the rules and regulations. So fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism is basically making up data, manipulating research, or copying others' work should not be encouraged. All right. Your clinical trial registration, again, like I said, you know, uh, that's something which I just put in towards the end so that all trials in India, they have to be prospectively registered, right? So before you take in and start the research, please look into the website. I've given you the link here, which is actually clinical trials and you can look it up and you can find out. Okay. There's also, you know, a list of quality journals, which are available for you. The UGC gives you a detailed list. All right. The Consortium for Academic and Research Ethics, the UGC CARE gives you a list of all the quality journals which are approved. So you can click on this website and then it will go take you to the recommended journals. And based on that, the group one, which are found to be good enough and the ones which are group two, which are indexed globally, so on and so forth. So please, you know, make sure this is taken care of. All right. Finally, some take home points for today's participants, right? I've just tried to put everything put together. Okay, and give you like a small take home message that in the end, right? You have done the first step, that is you are here to develop knowledge and skills, all right? Make sure the topic, what you do, you research and know the most about it, okay? Understand the methods and the statistical ways how you go about these things, okay? Your ethical approval, your registration of your research, getting your consent, increasing the benefits and reducing the risk to participants. Also extend the benefit of your research to participants and the communities and publish in recommended, safe and verified and qualified journals, okay? So these are your take home points which have to be very, very important for you to understand, all right? All right, so that would wrap up the session, okay? Please do feel free to reach me. Uh, that's my email ID, it's uh, dnzy at 